Um, what I'd like to do in this presentation is give, give a little bit of background of where kind of uh, intelligent transportation systems and infrastructure stand uh, and move a little bit into how connectivity uh, opens up some opportunities and what some of the safety applications are um, and some impacts, uh, further impacts on automation and some new opportunities. So as everybody in this room probably knows a lot of the, the background stats, but but freight, freight's growing. Uh, truck, truck and ground transport is a huge part of the freight movement. Um, and while those are growing, congestion on our, on our uh, both urban and rural roadways are growing. So those are at, at uh, crossroads with each other. And so uh, I come from a state where we're home to seven of the top 25 national bo uh, freight bottlenecks in the country. And with our population increasing, um, and trying to keep up with the infrastructure demands, it's going to be a challenge uh, on the freight industry. Um, and so this might be obvious to a lot of us in the room, but we have to keep, I know in certain circles it's not as obvious that we got to keep pushing the, that technology is part of the solution. Um, even the current administration coming in and is talking about more, more money for infrastructure. Well, technology needs to be a part of that. Technology helps. Uh, on safety, it helps protect the existing infrastructure, enhances mobility, and overall sp supports economic development. Um, on the ITS system, for uh, uh, there's probably a, a varied background in the audience about about ITS, but but the major components of ITS are surveillance, uh, detection, um, some sort of control. Um, and, and on the public agency side, when we talk about control of the traffic system, um, there's kind of passive and, and active control. Uh, I'd say the active control where, where drivers really have to f obey uh, traffic signals or ramp meters, those type of things. But we, have a, we really rely on a lot of passive control information passed on through dynamic message signs and, and the like. Um, and there's always a telecommunications component um, in, in the last uh, decade or so, there's been a lot more management software developed, and a lot of these, these regional systems are supported by traffic management centers. So the USDOT and, and state and local agencies for over two decades now have been developing ITS, and they're, they're fairly mature systems, especially in some of the, the urbanized regions, uh, both, both in the U.S. and, and uh, in, in Asia and Europe as well. Um, in the U.S., some of those early systems went back in the late 60s. So the, the Lodge Freeway in Detroit and the Gulf Freeway in Houston were some of the early examples. And so they're, they're approaching, you know, 40 to 50-year-old traffic management systems now. Um, so there's a lot we can do with real-time traffic information. There's a significant amount of public sector and private sector data on the traffic conditions on, on the nation's roadways. Um, a lot of that information is available both pre-trip and en route, whether it's through the internet, dynamic message signs, um, 511 mobile applications. Um, there's lots of different ways to consume that, that real-time information. Um, in the kind of in the commercial vehicle realm, though, a lot of that uh, ITS is revolved around regions, so they tend to be a, in, in some areas a little bit more. Uh, regional and doesn't always serve the freight industry that's looking at, at longer distance trips. Uh, probably one of the better examples is the I-95 corridor up and down the East Coast where they've they made a very concerted effort to try to share the data across all the states along that and, and those types of deployments are, are very helpful. Um, the uh, been working with USDOT's uh, Freitas program, the Freight Advanced Travel Information System, and they're looking at how to use this real-time um, data to uh, uh, help improve uh, freight operations, both drainage operations. They've had a couple demonstration projects on improving drainage information by incorporating this type of real-time traffic, and they're moving on some projects that I'll talk about here in a second on, on more overall corridor optimization. So that's the positive side. I was, on, I was on the phone with a reporter last night out of El Paso, a lot of truck movement between uh, you know, Southern California, uh, through Texas to the rest of the country, and uh, uh, they were p part of I-10 was under construction, and they were, the DOT was rerouting traffic off of I-10 um, and set up a, 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 a detour that they thought was logical to get traffic around. Um, between 3 a.m. and 5 a.m., 
They had over 100 trucks follow their GPS, ignored the DOT's um, uh, diversion route with the, the message signs were saying, um, and the GPS took them right into a dead end, and so, which was a kind of a two-lane road, and so the, the local police and so forth would help them try to turn around these trucks that had gone down, and that's, um, you know, this, this, so there's still some shortfalls in integrating and sharing some of this real-time traffic data to make sure that we have data from, from the local estate uh, perspective. Uh, kind of staying on kind of the, the state of the practice, the USDOT uh, over the last decade has spent a lot of time on integrated quarter management. Um, there, there were two national de uh, demonstration projects. I was involved in the Dallas project. The other one was in San Diego. A lot of similarities between the, the two projects, but it was really trying to take advantage of a lot of this real-time traffic information and moving to how do you optimize corridors across jurisdictions, across modes, and across routes. Um, what was in common to both the national deployments, um, both were using predictive systems and trying to look forward to what the traffic conditions would be 30, 60 minutes into the future and trying to um, select strategies, operational strategies that would address the future traffic conditions. Both sites used de decision support systems to help the local agencies in multiple jurisdictions make those decisions to, to jointly put in strategies. And uh, both relied heavily on the different mechanisms to disseminate pre-trip and en route type of information. So this is, um, this is another trend, I guess, nationally. There's several other cities looking to try to um, implement these types of systems. And the freight community benefits. I think the two national deployments kind of treated freight as just another traveler. I think there's opportunities to tailor some of this specifically to the freight and, and trucking community. Um, there's some, we're working on a project right now which I kind of call an ICM light version. So this is really just trying to optimize routes only, but this is I-35 through central Texas. TxDOT put 100 miles under construction all at once, um, and we're looking at um, some real-time information about uh, what the con uh, conditions are on the, on the I-35, the main route, and a, and a parallel um, toll road that was, that was built a couple years ago. Um, and one of that, what that requires, which isn't always in the, in the past been available, is full monitoring of, of not only the primary route but all the alternative routes so that you can, in real time, you, you know the conditions on both and can give travelers or, or commercial operators um, information, uh, good real-time information to help make that decision. Um, the alternate route is, is longer, which, which drives up operating cost of a truck, and it also has a toll on it. But uh, it's about 10 million minutes maybe uh, in drive time, but if the congestion through Central Texas, through Austin, Texas, can be an hour or more longer. And so the, the idea is to give, give the best real-time information out and let, let the travelers make, make uh, their best decision, whatever optimizes their business rules. Um, so right, and, uh, right now, as, as some of these ITS systems mature, we're starting to see some of these safety applications. The truck signal priority, I think Peter alluded to it, earlier, it's not widely deployed, um, but um, from a safety point of trying to, uh, if you know that a truck's approaching, especially in a high-speed situation, truck's approaching a signal, if you can hold the green time a little bit longer, the benefit of the truck gets through there, doesn't have to worry about potentially stopping and, and or worse, running a red light. And second benefit is they're not the first car in the queue when the, on the next traffic signal cycles. So that's not an advantageous situation to have a, a truck at the lead of the queue starting up on a green. So um, there's a lot, it's been shown to have benefits. It takes a little bit more infrastructure, it takes a little bit more uh, programming in the traffic controllers, but it's something, something we can do now. There's been a lot of deployments of curve warning speeds, the dynamic curve warning, not just static signing, but trying to uh, monitor the vehicles coming in and giving some sort of uh, warning back out. Um, but it still kind of relies heavily kind of on this uh, kind of passive control, if you will, the, the, the electronic signs, um, as well as we have road weather information and, 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 and work zones. And let me elaborate on, on one of the work zone projects that, that we're involved in. Um, smart, smart work zones are, are becoming a little bit more common. Uh, we're working with two different vendors on, on that 100-mile construction project in Texas. Um, so 
there's additional sensors put out along the roadway in advance of the work zone. So in this picture, you'll see there's a right lane closure on the right-hand side of this slide. The, the circles at the bottom are speed sensors that are actually um, in, in the traffic barrels, um, and they're monitoring in real time the, the speed of the traffic. Um, and so, and there's an upstream dynamic message sign. Uh, in some cases, we have multiple ones depending on how much uh, queuing we expect. Um, so it's warning of a work zone ahead when free flow conditions. As traffic starts to slow down around the closure at the right-hand side, the sign can, can uh, change upstream to warn that there's slow traffic. And then it actually can monitor how far that queue builds. And what's more important is not to tell the driver or the commercial operator when, where the lane closure is. What you really want to tell them is when's the, where's the back of that queue. And so as that queue builds up, you can actually warn that there's stopped traffic two miles ahead even though the actual lane closure might, might be, in this example, three miles ahead. So um, uh, these types of smart systems are here today, and, um, but they still rely, again, heavily on, on uh, in this case, a portable message sign with only eight characters, three lines, uh, side mounted on the, on the side of the roadway. Um, this is the type of equipment that's involved in that. The, you can see the, the barrels have the speed gun in it. Um, and then you can see the typical dynamic message sign. We, in this application, we're also putting out portable rumble strips to try to wake up travelers. Um, we're very focused on this because in looking at all the crash data around this work zone is that, that uh, heavy vehicles are overrepresented in the crashes. And so if we can get this type of information to, to the truck drivers, um, we think it improves the overall safety of the roadway. Um, multiple vehicle crashes were also on the rise um, and that we think that's attributed to uh, uh, involvement of, of, of more heavier vehicles. This is a, a corridor that um, at, in nighttime conditions has close to 50% trucks operating on it. Um, so uh, the state of the practice, you know, there's a considerable amount of data available now on traffic conditions, uh, uh, roadway design, weather conditions, incidents, work zones. Well, what uh, we need more effective ways of trying to get these into these safety applications and communicate with uh, commercial vehicles. Um, we're, right now, we're relying heavily, as I mentioned, about dynamic science. The more that we can do to put these into these safety systems uh, on board, I think we'll be even more effective. And take advantage of what some of the public agencies are moving towards, which is more proactive um, operation of the roadway and sharing, sharing what the agency is trying to do and what they think the conditions of the roadway are going to be in, in advance. Uh, uh, with a community like, like uh, freight and trucking. Um, building on another point that Peter mentioned, uh, we also you know, see this convergence of connected and, uh, and automated vehicles. So this idea of connected automation um, along with um, that connectivity to the infrastructure we think is going to really help some of these applications. So when I'm sure if you talk to some of the folks involved in, in autom automation, the problems are the, you know, the unusual conditions, uh, whether it's strange traffic control that us traffic engineers put up, uh, work zones, incidents, potholes, faded striping, faded signing. Um, you know, the one Google car accident that was the Google car's fault was uh, stormwater drainage treatment around an inlet that it didn't recognize. And so those types of unusual situations. All of those are infrastructure things, right? So the more we can make the infrastructure smart, the roadway smarter, and can communicate these, it helps the automation industry that's trying to solve these problems. Um, the point was brought up about, I think the gentleman the driveway, as I think, was talking about connectivity. And so um, while there is a big emphasis on the DSRC connectivity, but we see lots of opportunities for, for other types of uh, uh, cell cellular satellite uh, communications to help move both V to V and V to I types of uh, safety applications. Um, and uh, ASHTO put out their connected vehicle infrastructure footprint analysis, which kind of looked at what, what the state agencies largely in ASHTO, but uh, working with the, the local communities, what they thought they could commit to in, far, in terms of building out. And so there's kind of a 2040 plan of, of building out a national infrastructure of the connectivity side that puts DSRC, DSRC types of communications along roadways. I can tell from, that still sounds very far out, maybe 2040. 2040 is uh, 
the year they were estimating to have about 80% of the roadways instrumented, I'm sorry, 80% of the traffic signals instrumented and um, having, I think they estimated about 25,000 other locations to cover other, other, other roadways, non-signalized non locations. Um, but there's a real hunger from the, from the public sector agency to figure out what they should do. And I think you'll see some investment once they start to see the benefits to the industry in general, but also what, what benefits are brought back to the, to the public agencies. Um, so if you, if you look through, USDOT's kind of prioritizing some of the, uh, the V to I, vehicle infrastructure app, uh, safety and mobility applications. And, and then uh, in Europe, the EU has done a very similar exercise with their cooperative ITS, and there's a lot of parallel between the applications. So I'm just showing kind of the US, US ones, the paper outlines some of the, um, uh, the European ones, but you can see nearly every one of these has an infrastructure component that we can, that as infrastructure gets smarter and the data can be shared from these uh, to make that available directly w with vehicles and, and uh, commercial vehicles alike. Um, the, the other thing is that, um, and we probably don't talk enough about, is, is the, the geometrics of the roadway itself, that w when we design roadways, it's pretty, uh, um, permanent for quite a while. So we know the horizontal alignment, the curvature of the roadway, the vertical alignment, uh, clearances under bridges and overpasses, uh, crest vertical curvatures, anything that might hang up a low, uh, low trailer. The cross section in terms of narrow lanes, narrow shoulders, cross slopes, super elevations, all that data is fairly static and can be shared with applications so that as both automated and connected vehicles are driving these roadways. There's, there's no reason each individual vehicle could, um, doesn't uh, have that data available as they start to navigate a section of roadway. Um, as well as some of the challenges are the, the access points, the interchanges, ramps, the weaving areas, um, knowing which lane to be in to help uh, maximize safety and, and movement through those sections. And uh, a comment was made, mentioned earlier too about the existing safety systems that are on those vehicles. There's a lot of interest in, I think, in uh, from the uh, kind of the Ashdo State DOT side, is if we can figure out what um, infrastructure in terms of signs, striping, uh, pavement markings would make those systems work even better. I think in certain situations, those agencies would be very interested, in, especially in, in, in demonstrations of putting maybe a higher uh, standard of care of some of that infrastructure out there to help make those safety systems work. And so there is some research going on right now. NCHRP has, has a project out that we're involved in. It's looking at specifically at that. How can we, how can we improve the infrastructure to help support those safety systems? Um, since I used the work zone example before, I'll, I'll continue kind of on that theme, but it kind of applies across the board on the infrastructure. So, uh, and, and <coughs> Carl Anderson's left, but Carl, Carl's been involved in this USDOT project uh, with the Freitas program. Um, and it's trying to take that, that work zone data that I showed earlier with the smart work zone where have, we have very comprehensive data about uh, where the work zones are, which lanes are closed, how much delay is at everyone, how long the queue is at everyone in real time information and trying to share that. With the, so the Freitas program is trying to do some longer distance quarter optimization and they were partnering with this project because of the comprehensive nature of the database to try to see how, how uh, they, if they make use of that kind of incident, uh, lane closure, construction database to help optimize freight movements. Um, and the first phase, this comment was made, I think, earlier too, about um, uh, the first step is using commercial vehicles first. Um, that we think kind of be, because of the, the uh, fleet operations and, and potentially the, the technology that's adopted right now um, that, and we, the ability to have maybe a, a, po a very positive safety impact quickly um, is that they're looking for a couple of, uh, they're right now in the process of recruiting some freight operators to adopt some of the in-vehicle technology um, and the, the integration of all this data has, has been taken care of, that phase of the project's over and uh, they're, they're ready to start a trial with the, with the volunteer freight operators on this section of I-35. Phase two would be to try to move this uh, into a DSRC kind of environment um, and, and expand it to light duty vehicles as well. But the, the first phase 
um, is, is moving right in, uh, taking advantage of the <coughs> freight community first. Um, and this type, you know, the type of data that in the, the you know the infrastructure that's involved to produce this in a work zone environment, we have, there's a lot of uh, uh, you know uh, changes in, in uh, phases of construction, shifting of lanes. So everything that's deployed right now is kind of cellular uh, based with uh, solar powered po power, and then as the work zone completes, we put more permanent infrastructure in. But um, we're mon you know, we, we're able to monitor real-time travel times, speeds, volumes, um, and communicate that back out through the portable message signs. Um, and right now, you know, this is still, as I kind of mentioned, this is still how we're uh, communicating the information. We'd like to get that that same type of warnings um, directly into the, the cab of the vehicle. Um, so, lastly, kind of closing on some of the uh, some new opportunities, I guess. So. Uh, Truck platooning is one of those, um, and, and we've been in discussions with Steve uh, Boyd at Peloton as well. That they're looking at, at some of the locations for, for some of their trials, um, and we're interested in, um, in, in how some of this infrastructure data could be shared with a truck platooning system to um, help, their, help their operation, help their safety. So anytime there are changes in the geometry, um, that uh, whether that's a narrowing of shoulders, uh, narrowing of the roadway, it could be a permanent, um, be oops, sorry, because of some uh, constraints just in the corridor, or it could be because of a work zone or, or something like that, that, that uh, while, the, while the vehicles are platooning, they may want to increase their gap a little bit, depending on the, the nature of those changes in the geometry, um, and uh, also being able to communicate um, maybe not in a high-speed environment, but maybe in lower-speed environments about uh, things that pose challenges like roundabouts, uh, being aware of where bridges and, and low clearance points are, and as I mentioned, uh, access ramps. So um, this ability, uh, I, think, I think the early systems that, that uh, Peloton's working on are a lot of the, the automation, the level one type of automation they're working on is, is really vehicle vehicle contained and, and, uh, and communicating back to their uh, uh, central point, but can they take advantage of some of this, the infrastructure uh, data that, that uh, uh, is, is typically uh, housed on the uh, public agency side? Uh, another opportunity, I think, is truck parking. I think Michigan's probably done one of the best projects on I-94. I think one of the, the things is that this, uh, while ITS is mature on a lot of corridors, uh, state DOTs and maybe locals, haven't uh, necessarily instrumented some of the parking areas. So I think what Michigan found was the need to go in and put smart parking systems around uh, their stops to be able to count uh, trucks. The other challenge they had is how do you work with the private sector? Because a, a lot of the stops and refueling are, are privately owned, and can you get accurate information about the availability of, of spots um, in the pri on the private uh, commercial vehicle parking areas as well? Um, and, uh, and so on the, on, the, uh, on the right here is uh, a picture of Michigan's real-time map, uh, you know, identifying where the commercial vehicle parking, and they, they have real-time um, information on availability. Um, so as we uh, put more infrastructure into those types of facilities, um, I think it's an opportunity. And then it starts to open up things, you know, potential for kind of more reservation systems and allows for maybe op further optimization of, of uh, routing and logistics around around those points. And then lastly, um, you know, the last mile problem is challenging, and a lot of that is, you know, pickup and distribution in urban areas. Well, those urban areas aren't getting any um, less dense. So, um, you know, there's a lot of other uh, uh, solutions being discussed, uh, whether it's human-powered, UAVs, uh, different, different vehicles for automation. Um, and then how, if some of those uh, become viable in these urban areas, though, you still, what's the infrastructure uh, at these transfer points when you're moving it from, from a truckload to some of these other modes, and how do we design that infrastructure to help support some of those? Or I think those will be uh, challenges as we go forward. So with that, I'm bringing us back on time pretty well. I can take some clarifying questions. Mm -hmm.